He's a 10-time winner in tour-level events, 52 top 10s in tour-level events, 10-time Bassmaster Classic qualifier, four-time FLW Championship qualifier, fast approaching the $3 million in career earnings mark. He's also the recent winner of the FLW Toyota Series event at the Delta where he won the three-day event by almost 17 pounds. Welcome to the show, Ish. Oh, glad to be here. Uh, first question, what is your tow vehicle model and why did you choose that model? Well, it's an F-250 diesel. Um, to me, it's one of the best tow vehicles for towing day in and day out. I mean, the diesel has so much power. Um, it doesn't even know that the bass boat's there behind it. Uh, Ford makes a great vehicle. I've been running this one for a couple of years now. I had one for five years before that. I have another one that sits in my garage. It's brand new. And it's just the F-250 diesel from Ford is to me the best, you know, truck that I feel, you know, I mean, it, plus it holds all my stuff. I've got the Daiwa wrap on it, as you can see. Um, you can kind of go to the top there, the roof rack with the rods on there, as you can see that. And once again, when you get to the back, it's just pretty much, you know, empty so that you can put plenty of stuff in. Outstanding. Hey, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. You probably have, especially around tax season. How many miles do you drive this vehicle around the country each year? Um, roughly about 20,000 miles a year. Okay, wow, that's a lot of driving. So that, that got, it's, it's a vehicle that's got to be able to handle it. All right, now, the next question. Let's talk about boats. What boat do you, do you, do you use, and uh, what's your reasoning for using that boat? Uh, currently, right now, I'm running the Ranger, the 521L boat. Uh, to me, the 21 is the biggest, one of the biggest boats they make. It rides great in rough water, but I can also draft shallow enough. I've got that teamed up with the Lowrance Ghost Troller Motor, as you can see right here. Um, I've run a lap, Lowrance Electronics right here on the front of the boat. Uh, the Live 12, as you can see right there. Um, it's just, it's the way to go for me. You know, the boat itself, I teamed it up with Yamaha. 250 SHO, you can see power poles. I mean, without the power poles, you know, especially is the shallow water that I fish, very, very important. Um, one of the other big factors for me is, see if we get down here, the Bob's jack plate. For me, hydraulic jack plate allows me to fish a lot of the real, real shallow water. Um, I'm also running see here 12 on the console as well um, everything's hydraulic controlled right here and right there uh, the one great part about this boat is it has tons of storage and when I say tons of storage we're talking tons of storage I mean the middle compartment right here I can put rods in there all my tackle in there I've only got a couple of rods in there right now. I've got a wake bait in there and a Cinco in that one. Rods that I probably hadn't planned on using. And then you get into the rod locker. I've only got a few rods in there as well. Yes, that's a spinning rod sitting in there. <laughs> I, put one, I put one in the boat just because you never know. Um, my boat pretty much fishes pretty empty most of the time. I keep a lot of stuff out of my boat and in the storage. Like right now, the storage compartment, this one here is completely empty. Um, we get into the other rod locker here. Yeah, I've got some actual, I've got some boxes that you can see in there. Uh, but overall, the 21 boat is to me like the perfect boat from running rough water to drafting shallow to the way that I wanna fish. It might not be as fast as the 20, but at the same time, does that really matter? You know, you still got to catch them. You know, just because you're fast doesn't mean you're always going to catch them. Uh, Ish, I wanted to ask you a question about about the uh, the ghost uh, the ghost. Uh, that to me, that trolling motor is is absolutely amazing. For, I was blown away when Spotlock came out, but this even goes beyond that, doesn't it? Yeah, the ghost itself is the quietest trolling motor on the market. You can kind of see it in the background, right there. 
I mean, the ghost trolling motor to me, it's the quiet, it's the strongest, it cuts through the grass, everything I need to fish the way that I want to fish. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, now in terms of, uh, you, you talked about the big water and how it handles big water. Um, I always think about that run from the, the ramp at Lake Havasu up the river. And I always kind of feel like I'm holding my breath when I hit that river mouth right there. Cause you know, it's pretty shallow there. How, how's that boat handle that transition from the deep to the shallow? Yeah, with the Bob's hydraulic jack plate, the nose cone having the low water intake, you can jack it up and run those sandbars when you're fishing at Havasu. I mean, it's it, it's the way to go, definitely. I mean, you're talking anywhere from eight inches to a foot of water at times when you're running over some of the sandbars up the river there at Havasu. And then you got the boat wakes from all those big boats that they have, you know, that run up there and down the big cigarette boats. Yeah, that's, that's something too. So now, uh, I'm kind of an old school guy myself. That's uh, to say the least. Uh, are you a, are you a hand throttle guy or are you a foot throttle guy? No, I am definitely, as you can see down there, I've got my foot throttle. I'm all about the hot foot. You know, the hot foot to me allows me to have two hands on the steering wheel. Definitely when I'm trying to maneuver in some of those big waters, like the great lakes and, and being able to hold myself to the sea. What what do you uh, what do you like about the the Yamaha uh, as opposed to other choices you might have had to put that on there? One thing about the Yamaha for me has been reliability. I've run pretty much Yamaha the majority of my career, except for a year or two in the beginning. But I've always run Yamaha after that, and I plan on retiring running Yamaha because I believe it's the best engine out there. And and the engine size you're running a two fifty. Yeah, the two fifty SHO. The, is there is there is there a need for more horsepower? I think I've seen three hundreds out there on, on other uh, other outboards, and that, that's that's pretty that's pretty big. Yeah, you can run a three hundred, but then you start talking about burning more gas. I mean, that extra every time you put fifty more horsepower on an engine, I mean, one fifties get really good fuel economy. The two hundreds get less than them, and two fifties get less than them, and a three hundred even gets less than that, and. For me, sometimes I'm making really long runs and I need to have that extra, so I'll throttle down anyways. And so having a 250 is good, 300 I don't believe is necessary unless you just feel the need for speed. Yeah, I think that's a great point that you make there, you know, and that's something that uh, maybe a lot of us weekend anglers take for granted, but you are running a lot of, a lot of distance and a 250 is a lot more efficient than a 300 for sure. Yes, by far. That's a, that's, that's a, that's an excellent point. Um, and again, that's one of those nuggets, you know, I, I like to, I like to draw these nuggets out of guys when we're, when we're, when we're doing interviews and that's certainly something right there. So you, if you're thinking about, you know, you need all this power, but you got to consider how much gasoline you're going to be burning. And that, that's a, that's a good thing to think about if, if you're going out to buy a boat. Exactly. Uh, well, I appreciate you showing us through your boat here uh, today. I think this is a, this is a really a neat thing. Um, you just won a tournament on the Delta. How important were your electronics in that tournament for you? Electronics were huge for me, you know, with the Lorant stuff. The biggest thing was, is it tells you, the live units tell you about the tides. And so on the Delta, I was running the tides. And the first day of the tournament, I looked and saw that I had about a 30 minute window of slack tide and the area that I primarily wanted to fish. So I actually stopped where there was some tide on an area and it really paid off. It was actually an area that I caught the majority out of my fish on because I started there every day. After starting there the first day, catching 21 pounds, I never ran to the primary area that I wanted to fish. So I had 21 pounds the first day. Day two, I actually get into that air, same area, started in there, caught a one almost uh, six pounds. And from there just went to just crushing them and made it down to the primary area and caught two big ones down there. So at that point in time, I felt really good because I had the tides dialed in. My electronics showed me that and it was going to be hard for those guys to beat me. That, that's, that's, uh, that's just amazing. Cause you know, I can certainly understand you came from Sturgeon Bay uh, and that's a primarily offshore fishery. And I can certainly understand, you know, using the waypoints and things like that from your electronics at a place like that. But in my mind, I don't think, 
I don't think about how electronics would help you at a place like the Delta, but that that's amazing. Yeah, the, the tides are huge and, you know, the Lawrence Live units have the tides. I can look up the tide for a tournament next month, let alone even next year if I wanted to, and know what's going to go on with those tides so I can kind of prep myself on how I'm going to fish because, once again, tidal water, the tide dictates how fish want to eat and what they're going to eat. It's just amazing. You know, again, it's a, it's a question of when, a, when an angler – it's like the way we use our brains. The scientists say that we, we don't use our brains to full capacity. I wonder how many of, of the anglers out there actually use all their tools to full capacity. Um, it, it, you know, it, it might not occur to the regular, the regular person out there to, uh, to, to use that tidal information on a place like the Delta. That's, that's amazing. Thank you for that. No problem. Um, all right. Well, let's talk a little bit about this, you know, uh, this Delta win. So, when it seems to me in all my years fishing the Delta, when you go up there to fish in the Delta, you're fishing against people that, that know that impoundment very well. It's such a struggle to do well um, because you got all those, de all those Delta rats that are there. Now you obviously have grown up on the Delta, but you, you don't spend that much time there these days. Do you? No, not at all. I mean, the Delta, I mean, I fished more this year due to COVID on the Delta than I did pretty much uh, any other time, any other year on the Delta. Usually I only get like seven or eight days a year, which is usually the Toyota series event or, or a local tournament here and there. Um, for me, it was just, I know I'm not a Delta rat anymore, uh, but I do like to fish the Delta uh, when I get a chance because it's always going to be a shallow water fishery. Okay, so let's talk about that. Leading up to the Toyota event, uh, how much time did you get to fish on the Delta before the tournament actually started? I spent two weeks. I spent almost every day for two weeks, you know, five to six days a week out there, you know, checking the tides, figuring it out, you know, doing what I needed to do to be dialed in to catch those fish. Do, did, you, did you think that you had this event figured out during pre-fish or even before pre-fish? Not, not necessarily enough to win, but I felt like I could do good. You know, I felt like a consistent 15 to 17 pounds a day, which was going to be really good. And I said, if I got a big bite every single day, then yes, I would have a chance to win, you know, because I felt like it was going to take 20 pounds a day to win. And it took actually a little lot less than that. Yeah, you weighed 21.4, 23.9, and 21.0 over three days. There were some other anglers that had big 20 pound plus days, but nobody could match that consistency. Uh, what did you, how did you do that? Basically having enough water to fish, having enough areas and fishing the way I wanted to fish, you know, spending the time trying to catch those big ones. You know, one thing I heard is a lot of guys talked about chatter baiting and drop shot and, and it'll do well. And you could have a one day glory fishing that way. But if you go out there punching and frogging, day in and day out, you're going to be consistent, especially if you figure out how to catch them in the tides, you're going to have bigger bags consistently more than not. Take us through that, if you don't mind, Ish, because um, I know you're running tides. I know I've known guys that are very good at running tides, but, but when you talk about running a tide, what does that actually mean? So when you figure out the, the tide that the fish want to be on the best. So uh, this year with COVID, I spent a lot of time out there on the Delta and realized this year these fish wanted a high tide. So what I would do is when that tide started going out, I was running further and further south to maintain that higher tide that the fish wanted. And so when you have those areas like that where you might start at Big Break, then you run to Frank's Track, then you run to Mildred, then you might run down to Italian Slough, um, you're going to maintain that higher tide during the course of the day because the tide at Big Break and the tide at Stockton is almost a two hour difference. So if you have high tide at noon at Big Break, well, it's going to be two o'clock before that tide is going out in Stockton. So you could follow that tide all the way down. And, and that's, that was your strategy for this, for this win. Yes, definitely. Outstanding. Now here's a question I've been wanting to ask because, because, uh, you know, in my mind, they're the same fish, but how do you know whether to throw a frog or whether to punch? Oh, completely different fish in this event. The frog fish were on sparse tulies on tule berms, and the 
punch and fish was in matted heavy vegetation on the same tule berms, but we're talking matted heavy vegetation versus the sparse tules for the frog. And I'm guessing that those fish that are under the thick stuff could probably not come up to get the frog. Is that right? Yeah, they couldn't get to the frog and you couldn't work the frog well enough for them to come through it. Um, you could pull it to the edge and maybe get a bite here and there, but those fish were sitting deep down in those mats and they were in a little bit deeper water and they were in the thicker mats due to the, the hot weather. Okay, well, that, that's, that's a good piece of information right there because you know you think they're shallow fish, so it's gonna be a frog or a punch, but you throw a frog where they can get to it and you punch when, through the stuff that they can't get to. That makes good sense. <laughs> All right, tell, tell me about the Ish Monroe new, uh, new Jack flipping hook. I saw you talking about this on, uh, I can't remember where I saw it, but it's a special hook, tell me about it. Yeah, well, the new Jack flipping hook is a flipping hook and it's designed for guys who can't tie the snail or for guys who can tie the snail. Um, it gives you an upward cavitation hooking motion uh, of, of the hook and the bait, which will help you land and hook a lot more fish. It has a second eye on it, which serves two purposes. One, the second eye serves as a keeper, but you can also tie to that second eye and get the same cavitation of the hooking upwards that the uh, snail knot will give you. So, but if you can tie the snail, you can use it as a keeper. If you can't tie a snail, then you tie to that second eye. Who did you work with to produce this? This is this is a fascinating concept. I worked with Simon Chan from River to Sea. I mean, it's been a concept that I've been trying to figure out because I go do a lot of seminars and I ask how many guys can tie a snail and you have a hundred guys in a room and roughly 10 of those guys can tie a snail knot. And yeah, it's so not a I had, But anybody can tie a clinch knot yeah. or a San Diego jam. And so I, I just designed a hook that you can tie any of those knots and still get that same hooking action, which is going to increase your hooking percentage. The hooks are super sharp, and it's just, to me, the best looking hook ever made, and I've, that's the only hook I have. So I want to know now about the Ish Monroe Fat, Fat Matt Daddy. That's the frog you throw, right? The Fat Matt Daddy frog um, is my frog that I designed from River to Sea as well. Um, I used to have a frog by a different brand, and I felt like the hooks weren't strong enough, and they weren't big enough for landing a lot of those big fish. So I designed a hook first and then designed a frog around it. And the Fat Matt Daddy frog is one of the heaviest frogs on the market. It's five-eighths of an ounce. It lands on a mat really good, but it also walks really good and spits really good. What do you tell guys that have a hard time hooking frogfish, uh, me being one of them? I can get them to blow up on me, but it feels, I feel like I miss them more than I should be. What do you tell guys like that? It's all about equipment. You know, having the right rod, the right reel, the right line, and having the right frog. Um, the line being braided line, I fish 55-pound Samurai or 55-pound Daiwa J-Braid um, most of the time in open water. Then in the thick, heavy stuff, I'll fish a 65-pound J-Braid or a 70-pound Samurai Braid in the matted vegetation. Then having, you know, the Ishwin Row Signature Series ta Daiwa Tattoo Elite Series Frog Rod, seven foot four, it's an extra heavy action, but it has a little bit softer tip to getting that frog to walk in, but you got the backbone to set the hook and that's very important. And then a seven to one high speed gear ratio reel, the Daiwa Tattoo Elite Series reel I have, you're able to make really long casts with it. It has 13 pounds of drag that you can lock down because you don't want any drag when you're fishing that heavy a braided line. This is what I absolutely love about doing these kind of interviews because, you know, these guys give you absolute attention to detail and the little details matter, don't they? Yes, they do. Very much so. Yeah. Well, Ish, I appreciate you coming on today. This was our initial pro rig segment, and I think it was a great success. I mean, you took us through that boat, and there was some cool stuff we learned. And then the bonus, being able to talk to you about this win. What's coming up next for you? Um, I'm fishing the uh, new gen TOC on Clear Lake, then the Toyota series on Clear Lake, and then probably the U.S. Open. Very good. Very good. Thanks for being with us. This was, uh, this was an absolute gem of an interview. I appreciate it. Good luck to you in the future. Appreciate you guys. All right. Thanks, Ish. Hey.